And joining us now, George Smitherman, the former Deputy Premier of the Province of Ontario, former candidate for the Mayoralty of Toronto. And it's good to have you in that chair. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Are you really? Yeah, great. Liberated. Liberated? Yeah. From what? From uh, 12 years of uh, the political grind that left me very few evenings and almost no weekends and liberated to spend time with a two-year-old kid who's awesome. Now, I know you got a new family, so that's, that's all part of the mix. Uh, but everybody who is out of politics always says, I'm so glad to be out because I now have more time to do this, that, and the other thing. But they don't wish they were out, right? If you had your druthers, you'd still be in. Well, the people of Toronto decided that for me. So when Christopher and I uh, decided that I should run for mayor, we called the strategy up or out. And the people spoke, and quite convincingly too, and the message was clear. So I'm out and liberated to try my hand at some different things, to get back to my roots as an entrepreneur, as an example. We will talk about that, but I'm not, I'm not done with the campaign. Okay, I want to go on this a little bit. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was one of the most brutal campaigns I've seen, not just in terms of the tone among the candidates, but in the length. I mean, you guys were at that for a year, 100-plus debates. It didn't, as you indicated, didn't end the way you wanted it to. How long does it take to recover from something like that? I actually don't really think that campaign is properly described as brutal. I, in, in, for its length and rigor and all of that, yes, but I think actually in terms of the temperament of the campaign, for the fodder that was available, for the nature of the distinctions between the candidates, I think that, um, I think that was a campaign of relatively good temperament. I had uh, $400,000 to spend on advertising and decided to make all of that entirely positive, even though the foibles of my opponent were well known, and probably a lot of people would have said, you should pounce on those. So. I think actually it was a relatively tame campaign in the circumstances. In terms of its length and nature, recovery, I'm pretty sure I'm, uh, I'm, pretty sure I'm still uh, recovering, not just from that campaign, but it marked the end for me of a 12-year period in my life of the pursuit of active politics at the expense of almost everything else. But I've heard people say, for example, who've run for leader of a political party and they don't win. I've heard them say it takes a year before you actually stop thinking if only I'd done this, if only I hadn't done that. Not the case with you? They must have come a lot closer than I did. Because I actually... You came second, George. That's yeah, not bad. Second, uh, second by some distance. And I think this is important is I've watched people who lost narrowly agonize over this or that. But the nature of our loss uh, was around 100,000 votes. And not one thing or the lack of effort on the part of one people, one person or one group of people is what contributed to that. And there's a certain amount of freedom that comes that second, second guessing is kept, I think, a little bit more to, uh, to a limit as a result of that. I accepted the results that occurred at 8.08 quickly, rather quickly that night. Right. And um, you know, I think that uh, I've been uh, trying to dedicate myself to the uh, exciting next adventures. Had you ever lost anything in politics before? Um, no. So that was a first. I mean, I, I, I'd worked alongside candidates uh, for leadership and otherwise that experienced loss. And no, uh, you personally. certainly, no, that's the first time that I put my name forward that I lost. So what does that do to your sense of self when you lose? Well, I think that um, I was stepping up uh, in search of a bigger prize. Uh, I still could enjoy one of the vote totals, you know, pretty large in the grand scheme of Canadian politics to have run for the largest direct uh, direct election. But, um, you know, it, it is associated with the risks. When we decided to, as a family to run, we knew that there were risks because I expected to be facing an incumbent mayor and maybe in a race with people like John Tory and such. So it came as no surprise, really. And um, I think that uh, I've been managing through it pretty well. You've had some pretty good, you know, jobs along the way. You're a very long-serving health minister. Maybe longest, well, second longest after serving Dennis ever. Timberl, yeah. After Timberl. After You're deputy premier. Um, and then all of a sudden, you got no title, right? The day after the election, you got no title. Do people still return your calls? And do they, or do they, because I've heard politicians say they, they cross the street to avoid looking at me. They cross the street to avoid shaking hands with me. Have you experienced any of that? No. Uh, and I think that uh, it's part of the reason that I'm uh, feeling pretty good about circumstances. You, you see that... Um, that uh, hockey player or professional sports player towards the end of their career trying to get traded to the team that's gonna, you know, maybe make it to the, to the cup or to the trophy. I had a run uh, because of the support and confidence that Premier McGinty had in me 
that allowed me to exercise on behalf of the people of Ontario a lot of power and authority. And uh, I, I could say, I don't know if I've had a lifetime's fill of that, but I've had a lot of opportunity that I'm so grateful for. Everywhere I look, I can see things that I laid my hands on that I think in many cases are better, and I'm very, very satisfied. And I have built relations with people uh, of uh, friends and colleagues well, that are I uh, know, uh, so numerous. Sometimes you find out that after you, you don't have that title after your name, they're actually not your friends after all. I, I, I'm not, a, well, I'm not experiencing that perhaps in, a, in the universe of all of the people that I know there are some like that. But you know, when I was a minister, you could talk to people in the bureaucracy. I fought so hard for them to call me by my name. Hmm. That it was, because they're trained to say minister, 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 to see you as an office, this is my theory is that they're trained to see you as an office holder who come and go rather than as a human. You could uh, hear about the stories where I forced people before a briefing took place. Just call me George. Good enough for my mom, good enough for you. Hmm. And I said, you know, there'll be a day that comes and you're going to have to see me and just call me George. So I hoped not to have my whole identity wrapped up in those roles which come and go. Understood. Is it... And this harkens back to a line you used on election night when you said, you know, some, some, some of you pundits out there will say this was my race to win and I lost it. In which case, is it harder to lose a race that you're expected to win? I would say, uh, I would say yes, of course, uh, because, um, well, you're responsible for it. What I wanted to make sure on the night is to understand that for any of those pundits and people that wanted to armchair quarterback the thing, is that they need to look no further than me uh, for accountability, that there was no one else that uh, deserved it. It was, uh, it was mine. Now, the race changed a lot. I could tell you that I started out as a person where I thought experience as a change agent would be beneficial. And as the incumbent went away, I became the incumbent in a certain way. Mm -hmm. and it was a kind of an odd dynamic, and it wasn't one that I fully anticipated. And it kind of squandered for me this lesson that I've always said to people when they want to talk about politics. I said, timing is everything. You can have your mapped out by this election you're going to run, and et cetera, et cetera. But that in politics, timing is everything. The race that I left the cabinet to run is not the race that I ended up in. That is, uh, that, that's an interesting point because uh, you had no experience in municipal politics, but somehow you were cast as the incumbent. Was that because you were in first place in the polls for so long, or wh why was that? I think is also. I think that's part of it. Of course, um, I, I also think it is that in a certain way I had the patina of uh, of a government guy, hmm. and uh, you know, I. I in the times that I was Minister of Health or I was Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, I think I was seen as a change agent in those sectors. I certainly didn't wake up and say, you know, how's the status quo looking today? Mm -hmm. But in the context of the race, I think that the media saw me uh, with that kind of uh, government patina. And I think that the, the work that I did around things like policy, that it, there was a higher expectation about the quality of that work than maybe some of my opponents experienced. Now, knowing you a little bit as I do, let me try this. My hunch is at some point of the campaign, you were prepared to lose, but inside you were also saying to yourself, I can't believe I'm losing to this guy. I'm prepared to lose, but to lose to Rob Ford? Oh my goodness. Well, he was, um, yeah, there, there's a piece to that. And I think that I would hear it actually so often from uh, people that maybe have uh, be described as kind of the downtown elite. Um, but I think that whatever criticism people might want to make about uh, Rob Ford, now Mayor Ford, is that he deserves credit for his extraordinary discipline. To stick with a simple message for as long as he did is uh, something that is, uh, that is a credit to him and should not be, he should not be deprived of it. He was a formidable campaigner for that reason. And his team obviously was extremely effective about finding the, the, the seam uh, the sweet spot in the campaign. And because there was so much disenchantment with government and incumbents and a lot of economic insecurity, he was very, very authentic on those points, and I give them full credit for it. What's it like now, though, when, I mean, you guys uh, not too long ago did an event together, this Harmony Dinner, where everybody came together. Even though you were the one guy who didn't go into deficit running your campaign, uh, you participated in that. How, what's it like going up to him now, shaking his hand and having to call him your worship? Well, it's a it's a sign of respect that I'm uh, that I uh, happily pay. Happily? So the, yes, of course. He's earned the he's earned the right to be uh, called your worship. That's what goes with the that's what goes with the title. I'm 
you know, in politics, a lot of people have long memories and they remember that they hate that person from an election that occurred here, there, here or there. It's not really, uh, that's not really my thing. Would I rather be the guy exercising power and providing leadership to the city? Yes, of course, and everybody knows it. But, uh, you know, he won the election. I had a fair shot at it, and uh, it's appropriate that I would uh, pay respect on that basis. Okay, let's talk about now, because I don't have to tell you. Lots of people came up to me after this election was over, and they thought, George Smitherman is meant to be in public life. This guy is not going to be happy looking for a job in the private sector, and he'll be looking for his first opportunity to get his name back on a ballot at some time as soon as possible. How right or wrong are they? Well, time will tell how right or wrong they are, but for right now, they're really, really wrong. Uh, there are opportunities at the provincial and the federal level to re-enter the fray probably, you know, within a period of months. Well, I'm not, sure, I'm not going to sure eventually and maybe yeah, for federally. Sure. Right. But I'm not going to be doing it. I've, they ha you have to go back to the things that we talked about before. I have a two-year-old kid. Um, I've just spent 12 years of my life where I didn't have weekends. I could tell you, just I couldn't tell you uh, how exciting it is to scroll through your Blackberry as I've always done and to see those Saturdays and Sundays with very few commitments in them. And I'm enjoying that very much. I'm returning to my roots as an entrepreneur and want to show that I can uh, have success in uh, a broader array of things. I'm 46, almost 47. Will I run for office again? There's a prospect that I will for sure. I'd be foolish to rule that out. But anybody thinks that I'm uh, yearning and looking for the next place to uh, you know, lay down the uh, my name and to run for office, they're, they're wrong. I've never thought of you though as a guy who was really motivated by making as much money as possible. So how do you get as animated about being a success in the private sector as you were in the public sector? I, th I, think, it's about, uh, I think it's about a balance of things. It's about being able to use the time that I have to con continue to contribute to public uh, debate. Uh, whether that's uh, sitting on panels and doing uh, work with organizations like the Border Trade or, uh, or venturing in to lend a hand to an NGO or a charitable organization. I've come to experience that community is where it's at for me, and I'm always going to be active in community, but there's more than one uh, vehicle by way, uh, by way of contribution that you can make in your community. And I think that I'm going to show value in those places. So let's figure out what it is. We know that you've already made your radio debut. You were on News Talk 1010 the other day, uh, filling in, ironically enough, for John Tory when he was away. It's hard for me to imagine that uh, there were those days when he was leader of the Conservatives and you were the health minister and he was belting you with questions across the floor. And now you guys are sharing the same radio space from time to time. That's a bit odd. So, okay, you got the radio gig. What else is out there for you? Well, the, the radio gig is something that I'm going to do, I think, on an occasional basis, kind of like a substitute teacher. And I enjoyed it on one level, but as I was mentioning to you before and to your, uh, to your spouse last week is it forces you into a headspace of reading the papers and all of that, which I've been a little bit liberated from. But I'll do that from time to time. I'm going to focus on uh, my roots as an entrepreneur. People forget that I was a small business person for more than a decade and that I come from those roots. Energy, infrastructure, healthcare sectors, the places where people should expect that I'll be uh, active. And some of that will provide me uh, with the opportunity to offer commentary on matters of uh, public policy and try and move public policy issues along. But there will always be at the core of George Smitherman, a community activist. And, uh, you know, I'm going to do some work with Central Neighborhood House. I'm doing some work at Ryerson University on an extraordinarily exciting initiative they have there called the Digital Media Zone. Yeah, and we know about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, so, you know, having a chance to work with Sheldon Levy is uh, something that I'm looking forward to. So it'll be exciting. I, I don't hear the dreaded L word, though, but I think, is this what you're doing? Are you going to be a lobbyist? No. I think that uh, by now I could have been one of the most advanced lobbyists uh, known to Queen's Park. I've had overtures left, right, and center. And I've met with many people over a coffee and offered them my point of view on their file. But no, that's not the kind of work I'm going to be doing. I'm going to work as a uh, business development-oriented uh, person. I want to help to bring value to uh, organizations and to be compensated accordingly. And I want to work uh, to have the advantage of time uh, to do things that are important at the community level. I'm certainly going to focus in on something that's youth-oriented. I haven't landed on it uh, yet, but uh, I'm really excited by the prospects of being uh, an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur and working in my community as I always have. Are you going to be involved in Liberal Party of Ontario activities behind the scenes? 
Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, there are so many of the members there that are uh, friends of mine, uh, but uh, I'm not uh, running. I don't anticipate taking on a big public role, but most certainly I'm going to try and uh, lend a hand, uh, especially to, uh, to a few of my uh, colleagues that I'm particularly close to. On, on that day after you know, you've lost the mayor's race and you now have to sort of figure out, okay, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Who do you call for advice? On that day? Well, not necessarily <laughs> the day, but once Firstly, you... Firstly, sleep for a couple of days. Exactly, that's exactly. But then once you realize you've got to put something together, who, who are the people you call to say, okay, you've done this before. Yeah. What did you do and how can I learn from your experience? I'm still doing it in a certain sense. My life is... Uh, my life is still, uh, you know, 10 coffee meetings a week and checking in with people and finding out about what's happening in various sectors. But I've had the advantage always. It's part of my, part of what I'm so fortunate around is having gotten involved in politics at the age of 15, I've always had people from Barbara Hall, David Collinette, David Peterson and the like that have been able to give me advice. I've talked to people like uh, Bob, uh, Robert Pritchard. I've talked to people uh, like, uh, um, like the deputy chairman of, uh, of TD Bank, the former premier uh, Frank, McKenna, Frank McKenna, and a variety of other uh, folks who offer, uh, who offer very, very good insights. So I think I'm, I'm just so fortunate to continue to have people like that that can give me advice. A fellow named Lawrence Bloomberg, who's the chair of Mount Sinai Hospital, mm -hmm. is someone that I'm just so lucky that public life has given me the opportunity to come to know incredible people like him. And they all offer me advice and insights on how to move forward. Do they offer you jobs as well? I, I'm, I'm uh, more interested in uh, working to uh, find the right spot and to focus in those uh, broad sectors. And I'm not uh, energy and infrastructure and healthcare and uh, I'm not wanting for opportunity. There's so much stuff out there, uh, really, that uh, I've got already a good uh, basket of things that I'm focused on, but they're a basket of things that allow me as many days as possible to be home at 5.30 when Christopher and Michael come home, and that is a luxury that I've never in my uh, life imagined I would have the opportunity to, to have, and for right now, getting home at 5.30 when the Daycare Express arrives <laughs> is uh, just as good as anything. Well, enjoy it while it lasts, because I think it's not going to last forever. I think that um, I'm certainly somebody that uh, likes to be busy, hmm. and right now I'm, uh, you know, probably functioning at about 40 or 50 percent of my uh, of my known capacity. Hmm. Uh, but hey, it's okay to decompress and to make that uh, transition. And like I said, uh, I have lots of good things to do with that uh, time, and more than anything else, that's what I'm enjoying right now. I'm expert at building Lego towers. I'm a really good book reader. I have uh, animated uh, voices for all forms of character, and I'm uh, really enjoying that in a way that I, I never really imagined I would as much. Enjoy. Thank you. And thanks for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thanks a lot.